Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome to Racial Healing Through the Art, part of Hands Up Atlanta Art and Activism Series. My name is Alexis Woodard, co-director of, the of the Alliance Theater's upcoming production of Hands Up, Seven Playwrights, Seven Testaments. I'd like to extend a welcome to all the community organizations in attendance tonight and our co-host, Not So Strong. Hands Up is a collection of seven autobiographical monologues about what it feels like to be Black in America. Um, the production was commissioned by Keith Joseph Atkins by way of the new Black Fest in 2014. Seven Black playwrights were prompted to respond to the murder of Michael Brown in 2014, among many others, um, about racial tensions in America. To start tonight's program, Please enjoy the premiere of two short films developed by myself and my co-director, Keith Arthur Bolden, uh, that are developed around the themes of two of the monologues in Hands Up. The first is Dead of Night, and the second is Abortion. Um, Dead of Night is about, is about Black womanhood, and Abortion is about Black parenthood. Um, again, thank you all so much for being here, and enjoy the world premiere of these two film shorts. You say making love to me was the equivalent of what, phone sex? He says, I like you a lot, but I don't have passion for you. Limp dick bastard slaps me, surprises me. I switch, his ugly becomes me. I'm not gonna let his ugly win. Dazed. Bitch! I can't. Breathe. He pushes me through his front door. 115 pounds little black me. First, just want to say that I love you. And I think you're great. I really, really do. Right. I haven't even met you yet, but technically you're not a real person. Not in the physical sense. In fact, you're not even conceived. Just an idea. An idea. So, um, I guess this is the point where I gotta tell you why you'll never be born. At least not through me. How can I bring you into a world I haven't made better. I mean, what kind of a father is that? I won't have it. I'm sorry, dear soul, I just can't bring you here. Not till I do my part, till I make the world different, better for you to be here.
goodness. I was on mute that whole time. Thank you guys so much for watching. And um, now to welcome to the Zoom stage, someone who I'm sure knows how to use Zoom better than me, um, the moderator for tonight's discussion, Minka Wiltz, actress, writer, and the host of the Cultural Workers Podcast. You would think I know how to use it. I don't, Alexis. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. And before I introduce our panelists, uh, I would like to give uh, everyone who's watching a few moments just to reflect, put in the chat, use your chat to reflect on uh, the trailers you just saw, the uh, short films you just saw. If you have any thoughts, I would love to read some of them out loud. I won't use names, but I would love to share some of them with everyone who's watching. So just type in the chat any thoughts you might have to what you saw. Strength. Strength. One word, exclamation point. Yes, in both of those I can see the strength that the, the protagonists had to have to endure it. The, the heartbeat was a compelling, physically impactful choice. Yeah, powerful pieces, agreed. Raw and visceral, honest. I enjoyed the physical work so much in the first. Yes, the first piece by Miss Cynthia. Miss Cynthia Barker, heartfelt, pro provocative, and it made me think. Uh, one person has said, I am so concerned for the self-esteem over young black women. I have a friend who wants to be a granny, but her son is not interested in bringing a child into this crazed world. Relatable. Would you feel differently if the actors were Asian or white or American Indian? Another uh, comment is reality. Juxtaposition of in the moment action and historical footage makes me want to watch again and think about it more. These are all really compelling ideas and that's, that's about all the time we have for now, it looks like but thank you for sharing. Uh, before <clears throat> I introduce the panelists, um, I'm so excited to be able to be a part of this conversation in any capacity. And I would like to start by introducing you all to um, our illustrious panelists. Um, let's start with Miss Shaniqua Gay. Um, Miss Gay's work. She is a fine artist and her work evaluates place, tradition, storytelling, and subject matter to develop imaginative dialogues and alternative strategies for self-imaging through installations, paintings, performance, video, and monumental sculptural figures. She fabricates environments of ritual and memorial. Hello, Ms. Gay. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Wendy Phillips. Dr. Wendy Phillips is a psychotherapist and expressive arts therapist. She's a faculty member at Goddard College and Saybrook University and a group therapist for the Baton, Baton Foundation. Hello and welcome Dr. Phillips. Thank you so much. The work is so powerful and I'm in reflection. Yes, yes, and we're gonna get into it y'all's um, responses as well. I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, next is Amanda Washington. Um, and she, oh, hold on, let me get to my notes. She's the founder and co-host of Theater From My View, which is a YouTube channel exploring theater, the theater world through an African-American female's perspective. Um, a f African American female director's perspective. Excuse me. Um, and we have Alexis 
Woodard. Um, Alex, I'm sorry, we have Dr. Ayana Abrams, I apologize. Um, a licensed clinical psychologist in Georgia. She's co-founder of Not So Strong, which is a platform for black women to use vulnerable storytelling to improve mental health and their relationships. All right, do I have everyone here? Everyone unmuted? Great. All right, so let's get started and let's start by asking, do any of the panelists want to share your reactions uh, about the short films, your reactions to the short films that we just saw? I definitely felt my heartbeat speeding up for both of these characters and wondering why, why do they feel forced to make this choice or to stay in these types of, or specifically for the first one, for this woman to stay in this type of relationship? Like, why did she feel that that was her only option? <sighs> Yes, my heartbeat was speeding and I tried to calm it down, but I just couldn't because like someone said in the chat, it is a reality. Yeah. I think about trauma um, for us as African-American people, for African-American women and how it's been with us projected across generations. And that sometimes what we decide to do or not do has to do with something that came from another place um, that we're not able to, that we're not conscious of or clearly able to articulate and how trauma to me um, feels so significant because it's a disruption and a denial of all that we feel is true and our, idea, our ideas about being safe or finding place and that really spoke to me in the first piece. Hmm. Yeah, I thought um, they were both powerful pieces, um, but the first definitely um, one because I can relate to what Dr. Wendy was saying, having a generation of women dealing with domestic issues um, in October is Domestic Violence Month, D Domestic Violence Awareness Month, or I'm not sure how many of you know, and I most recently had a family member um, actually die by the hands of her partner uh, last week. And so um, that hits home on several ends um, as witness, um, as survivor in the household with my family, and then as someone who, like I said, just had a recent family member die by those hands. And, um, you know, recognizing that we do have choices. We, we do have choices and um, be the, the choice to stay or to leave is important. And, um, you know, just speaking to uh, the gentleman that was making the choice not to bring a child into the world because they wanted to make life better uh, before bringing a child in. And, you know, I'll play devil's advocate. What if the child is the one <laughs> to make the change? Um, so it's, uh, it made me think about the movie Children of Men. Not sure how many people have seen that, but Children of Men where we didn't have the choice any longer, right? Uh, where no children were being born. And so I think um, on one end, I agree, but on the other end, I'm kind of oscillating on that, but both were very powerful pieces. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ayana? I was struck by the, the narratives, right? And I'm, I'm big in storytelling, right? So the words that they were using to tell their stories versus where, how I might've narrated their story and kind of even the language that we're using to, to talk about their stories and just kind of thinking about how different that is and how that factors into our traumas and our choices and kind of different behaviors that we make, right? But who's, who's telling the story, right? And kind of who's connected to the story in those ways, but listening to the language they were even using for what they were experiencing and thinking. Mm -hmm. hmm. So we're here talking about, specifically talking about um, mental health using art to heal and mental health in, with black women. Uh, can, can we move to the question of um, the notions of being a strong black woman, a strong black woman? And uh, um, I would like to start with you, Dr. Ayana, uh, and ask what the label of a strong black woman means to you. I, I first even appreciate that you honored it as a label right, that it's something that, that's oftentimes or that has historically been offered to us 
and then black women have taken it in and kind of internalized it as kind of how we are and kind of who we have to be. Um, but the, the basic tenets of the, the trope and the myth of the strong black woman is this woman who can do it all, right, and feel no pain with it. Um, she is invulnerable. Um, she is wise. She has all the, the, she has to make the right decision. She's a bit of a perfectionist. She needs no help right, which means she takes on everything herself. Um, and the, the mythical part of it is that, you know, there, there's a dehumanizing piece to the strong Black woman, right, because she can take everything, she can take it, and she's kind of honored in this way, it's kind of a badge. Um, but what we know and what we understand and what we experience is that she is human and that she can't take all of that. So she cracks and she breaks and she sheds, but it's on the inside. Right, because she's been taught for so long that she can't express that, she can't be vulnerable. So now I can't offer you that I need help or that I need assistance or that I'm tired or that I'm scared. So it becomes this very vicious cycle, right, of not feeling strong, but having to be strong, right? Because what might happen if I show that vulnerability in a world that doesn't care about me? Right, right. This goes back to a comment that I think Shaniqua said and what Dr. Ayana is bringing all together full circle is that who's in charge of the story and then knowing that you have a choice. But if we're not in charge of our own story, we may not realize that there are choices out there for us because that narrative hasn't been told. Right. And so it's so interesting to start to see these platforms of us being able to take back our stance and coming forward to ask for what we need mm -hmm. and not being ashamed of asking for help. Do any of you think that it's ever been a positive label? I, re I, I release strong black woman. <laughs> you can have all of that. Um, like, well, because I'm so much more complex. Mm -hmm. I'm so much more layered than just being a strong black woman. Uh, you know, it made me think about Melissa Harris Perry's um, Sister Citizen, right? Where she's speaking about these labels, right? These um, mammy figures, strong black woman, Jezebel, like all the labels, all the things. And um, you are, you're not sitting with a black woman and knowing her. Yeah, I, I feel like the world could come to those notions, especially if you're, um, you know, an avid media watcher. <laughs> um, but all the women here presently are more than just strong. We're also vulnerable, we're also creative, we're also proud, we're also weak. Like, it's a part of, you know, just the human experience is more than just being strong. So I do, I, I release her, I put my cape away <laughs> uh, because I'm human. Yeah. Amen. Dr. Phillips? I think it's helpful to try to have a sense of where this came from historically. Mm -hmm. Archetype symbols. So some of this is what was projected on us by um, people who are not African-American people. Imagery, if we look at it, it, film and, and so forth. Uh, and it's also, I think, helpful to think about why Black women may have, in, have taken on this persona in relation to the dangers, what people suffered in slavery, sexual assault, um, non-consensual non relationships, uh, the dangers of everyday life, that becoming bigger and stronger than, than life uh, may have been a compensation to survive because reading narratives of enslaved woman, women, the National Humanities Center has a collection of narratives of formerly enslaved uh, persons who were interviewed at the time of abolition and then has separated out those narratives that have to do with physical violence against women. Mm -hmm. And they're very painful to read, but reading them has helped me have a sense of the kinds of compensations that people made that may not be helpful or healthy across generations, but I, I really get it, I understand why. And I think historical context is very helpful uh, so we can have empathy for ourselves and our ancestors and uh, use that empathy as we as we move forward. That's a really powerful <clears throat> thing to hear you say over time. We, we're talking, I heard you saying how we are interacting with one another, um, but I'm also interested now in talking more about institutionalized health and the healthcare system, how we have, how that has trickled into 
health care of black women. Um, th those notions and the impact of the treatment of a black woman. Dr. Abrams, can we start with you? I would love to hear from everyone. But can we start with you, uh, your idea, your um, experiences and insight into how that has affected the treatment of, of mental health with black women? Absolutely. Um, so what we're talking about is <clears throat> medical racism and not only in terms of medical care and like hospitalist care, uh, but also in the mental health care um, system and the, the system of psychology historically, um, that these kind of notions of strength absolutely impact how we view, right, um, what Black women experience, how we take in their narratives, um, and what we believe that Black women experience, right? So what we've seen, you know, more recently in terms of um, news reports and looking at um, uh, the black um, uh, maternal mortal mortality rate, that when we look at medical racism, um, the way in which it affects mistreatment, right, of black women is that we are not believed. Our pain is not believed, right? Our stories are not believed in terms of we are experiencing this. Um, all of us have, you know, kind of personal or professional stories in terms of when we have interacted um, with spaces that don't have competent and culturally competent care, um, that the way in which they take in our narratives is very, very different, right? And it's a subconscious or unconscious bias, implicit bias <clears throat> um, that is there where they say that they know more about our bodies than we do. So when I say that I'm in pain, they say, oh, you're not in that much pain. Right. When I say, oh, I think I, I learned about this. I need someone who kind of who can um, talk to me in this way, who can treat me in this way. They say, you don't really know that you need that. I know better than you. Right. So that's how it shows up in terms of the um, the medical system and the healthcare system in general is do we believe black women when they say what's going on with their bodies? Do we view them and regard them as experts on their bodies while I might be expert on the treatment and do we collaborate? with them, right? And oftentimes the answer is no, that those relationships don't feel collaborative, right? They feel top down, they feel projected, and that then leads women to not feeling as um, autonomous, right? Or kind of part of their care. And it also makes well, particularly black women retreat from the healthcare system. And then they're blamed for the retreat. They're blamed for not seeking health care, right? You know, um, either proactively or, you know, when they first notice concerns. And it really dismisses the whole history, right, of how we have been treated by the health care system. And, and that, that extends to educational systems. That extends across yeah. every system. As well, how we seek any kind of counseling. Mm -hmm. And so, Dr. Phillips, with the dehumanization, that, that type of dehumanization of pain of black women and medical racism. Um, can you talk more about some of the ways that racism may affect the psychological development of black women in their youth and moving into adulthood, racism and trauma specifically? So we, we take in our lived experiences and our lived experiences inform our conceptualizations of ourselves and how we think about our identity. And sometimes uh, um, traumas and uh, experiences that don't facilitate growth are taken in and we're not even aware of those things. And if we don't find ourselves in relationships with others or more um, women who have more life experience or other people we can talk about those things with, we don't necessarily even realize that the source of a problem is not me because there's not been a chance um, to, to think about it from a different perspective given the, the culture and society that we live in. Um, I also think about um, the word microaggression. I hate that word because I cannot think of something that's happened to me that someone would call a microaggression that's micro, horrible things. For example, I remember being a doctoral student at Georgia. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Come on, doctor. I want to hear the story. I want to hear it. Y'all, everybody on edge. <laughs> we all lean forward. <laughs> Dr. Philip, refresh, refresh or something. Oh my goodness. Hey, is she back? I, was I gone? Yes. I'm here. <laughs> okay. I was saying I can remember experiences. Uh, for example, being a doctoral student beginning at Georgia State and walking into the cafeteria and this young white guy slamming the door on me. Now, that wasn't a microaggression. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but many people would name it that. So for me, that that term just doesn't have relevance, but it, it serves to diminish mm -hmm. the traumas we experience on a daily basis. And if we don't get to a place where we can sort that out, to have a sense that this isn't something we deserve to, re to receive or isn't natural or normal, then we take it all in and to me it affects our mental health and can affect our physical health and our ability to be in relationship with others. Wow. Yes. Now weathering. What was that weathering? Weathering, weathering. I don't know if you guys remember um, uh, probably about two or three years ago that terminology began to pop up a good bit for black women uh, specifically in regards to mon maternal care, right? A lot of Black women were dying uh, in the midst of childbirth um, and sometimes before. Um, and one of the, the terminologies that was kind of working its way around was weathering, right? Weathering the storm of racism. Oh, wow. Uh, the, the thing, the ways that we carry, right? So going back to the myth of the strong Black woman, hmm. um, outside of it being a myth, it's actually something many of our sisters carry, right? Um, that we feel like we, we have to be responsible. Um, some, and also the ways that that um, mutes us, mm. that we don't speak about our pain, that we won't tell people that we're in pain because we're holding the myth of being strong. Um, yeah. And I'm sure the doctors can speak to that way more clearly than I can. <laughs> Oh, that's exactly it. It's a disorienting experience to have, right? That <clears throat> even in, in, in moments in which we can recognize um, how human that we are, that we can't offer that elsewhere because we are then denied being human. But then we are expected, right, to engage in kind of these superhuman ways, right? So it's, a, it's this really vicious cycle that can feel very, very disorienting and leads to um, a, a severe kind of disconnect even from your own body. Right. So in talking to black women, um, clients who don't even recognize, right, you know, symptoms of depression or anxiety um, or bipolar disorder or any kind of episodes, any mood episodes, they're so disconnected from their bodies that one, they either think that's the norm mm -hmm. or two, they don't even realize that that's what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. The norm is to be overloaded. The norm is to be responsible for everyone. The norm is to not be taken care of by anyone in the world. The norm is to not make any mistakes. All right. So even in their humanness, they, they see that as a deficiency, not as being human, but as being wrong. I also think about wrong. Yeah. I also think about the ways that students are trained in mental health. And if you get someone, if you're a student and your faculty is using outdated books and conceptualizations about quote unquote diversity then that just begins the path to someone who's a professional who's not able to be helpful at all. So 20 years ago, perhaps, knowing about someone's race or cultural background was the key to understanding everything. And, and it's not. But if someone's still stuck in those old models of understanding a person, then it's troubling. I uh, um, use the work of Tracy Robinson Wood who's a psychologist counselor and her theory is called dimensions of identity theory and she says you can't know about one characteristic of someone everyone has many dimensions they're all fluid what's most important to a client when they come in to see you in the moment may have to do with any any of those dimensions and the only way you can know that is to speak to them about the concern they're bringing to you in therapy that day so she, uh, she talks about race. She also makes a distinction of uh, ethnicity because ethnicity has to do with traditions like foods and ritual practices If we think of countries where there are people who are from the same country, but uh, race is, is, is part of the experience for say Cuba, for example. Um, race and ethnicity are, are separate constructs. She talks about uh, gender identity. She talks about sexual orientation. She talks about education level. She talks about social class, which we know for people of African descent is not directly related to educational achievement. Uh, and then also talks about experiences in people's lives that they have control over and don't have control over. 
So if you're someone who's living in Louisiana now and you've been in a hurricane and that's the trauma and that's something that sets you back, that's out of your control. If you're someone who's been able to go to school and, and receive an education and maybe a license that changes your situation economically, that's something that's in your control. So there are just so many aspects of someone and, and uh, we're not unidimensional. And being aware of that and being aware of needing to connect with the client on whatever aspect of themselves is most important in the moment uh, to me is a way for me or someone else to be effective as a therapist. And that that kind of education and training needs to be offered to the people who aspire to work uh, clinically with black women. So let's, <clears throat> let's talk about other ways other than um, medicine along with counseling, let's talk about art. Let's talk about how we use art to heal as a medium, your artistic medium. I'd like to start with you, Shaniqua. Um, can you talk about what, how you use your medium uh, as a site for advocacy and healing for black women? Uh, yeah, I can um, speak to an exhibition actually I have coming up. Um, I recently did a install at ACLA Museum, which is in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, and the piece is called Holding Space for Nobility, Honoring Brianna Taylor. Um, so it's my goal um, to always take up a lot of space. <laughs> uh, it's really important for me uh, to have a lot of scale within my work. And my skill and subject matter is normally Black women. And so in this piece, Brianna's taking up a lot of space. I made the proposal uh, to do this work about 125 days into her not having any justice. This is um, before um, we received the verdict about the police officers not being charged. Um, but they, they did allow me to take this up. And so I have about four walls full of nothing but Brianna and um, just huge images uh, that I hope that the patrons and audience are able to take up. And, Around her is an altar of tiara glass. Remember old school black tiara glass? My mother had a lot of it. And um, uh, in this tiara glass is salt water. It's a representation of our tears and also of her sacrifice, right? So Brianna is now a ancestor and we wanna honor her in that way. And so these are the ways that I um, uh, create advocacy in my body of work just to heal for myself as a black woman. Um, uh, understanding her experience, but not knowing it um, and wanting to do something. Um, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm not a marcher. Um, I'm not going to get out there and march, but I am going to use my work as a form of advocacy um, uh, uh, to be an activist through painting, through photography, through filmmaking. I can advocate that way. And I can advocate in an unconventional space, right? Uh, a museum is not necessarily a space where we um, would think to be a space of advocacy. But um, if you let me in, that's what I'm going to use it for. <laughs> Wonderful. Amanda, I'd like to hear more about what you do with your art as advocacy as well. Yes. So I started Theater From My View, my YouTube channel, because I left graduate school. And while it was a great and fabulous training, I don't regret any moment of it, I didn't feel as if I knew who I was. And in certain situations, I felt myself going silent because it's like, okay, they don't appreciate my perspective, so my perspective might not be good enough. But that's not true at all. And so I started Theater From My View, one, as somewhat of a therapeutic session for myself of saying my views are important no matter who, uh, who validates them or who doesn't validate them. And so I put that artwork or my perspective out into the world every day through that manner. There are some other things that I'm up to right now in just creating a solo piece of myself in, in reverence to all of the women who have poured into me because I realized I might not be the only one who has been silenced. I know I'm not the only one who has been silenced. I see that attributes in my mother and in my sister and in the work that they do every day, having their opinions overlooked and ignored and that mentally getting them in their head. And so 
I want to do a piece where I'm not only honoring myself, but the women who have come before me and validating that they're not crazy and their opinion is not lesser than. It is just as good as sometimes better. <laughs> so yes, that, that's how I advocate for myself. And it's, it's through directing, it's through moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you all um, for sharing that. So we move on and uh, talk about specific issues like assimilation is a big one. Mm -hmm. That was something that <clears throat> was on my mind when we were, uh, when I was thinking about questions to ask, it feels like assimilation is something that has been done for so long. It's just expected and um, not questioned anymore. And there's so many different ways that people to assimilate and try to fit in. Um, Dr. Dr. Abrams, could you talk more about your viewpoint in, ter in terms of if, if assimilation is, is being addressed, you know, in the American landscape, artistic landscape, and I would love to hear from all of you, um, the artistic landscape, if it's being addressed uh, or not? You know, I think, I think the ways in which we use the word assimilation is not actually what the expectation or the experience has been. <clears throat> so I think assimilation um, at its core um, is about being able to, you know, kind of adjust into and kind of be similar, right, in some ways in terms of like what is around you and kind of what is the quote unquote norm. Um, but what we see, right, as the norm, whether it be the artistic norm, the educational norm, just the landscape of, of where we are and, and um, who we are, that the expectation and or the projection, right, has been that we strip our culture, right, and, and only bear kind of what the norm is, right, and the norm kind of being with the, the white gaze or with the male gaze, <clears throat> which is very different than being able to, um, you know, kind of come into a culture and still kind of hold parts of yourself and kind of bring yourself fully into spaces and kind of marry them in that way, um, that particularly Black women have not been afforded right, that space to kind of marry and kind of bring forward um, and kind of shift kind of what's going on kind of in the, in the current landscape. Um, so I think that's where there's a miss between the word assimilation versus what people actually experience and what is expected of people, right, that assimilation um, gives you this kind of vibe or kind of sense that everything can kind of um, coexist and that's not actually how we experience things. What I have seen in terms of um, media more recently, right, is that there's actually been a rejection of assimilation, which I, I'm okay with. I love that, right? And kind of just bringing, you know, the broad spectrum, all right, of Blackness into film, right, of Blackness into art and saying, hey, we're rejecting what you've been projecting onto us. Um, and I think that actually provides a lot more safety, a lot more nuance, and a lot more confidence and self-esteem um, for Black women as we reject the notions of assimilation and carve it out anyway. This goes back to taking back your story and taking your choice. And not only like we are projecting our own Blackness and promoting it in different formats, but making sure we start not only with the actors, but with every step of the process, the play that we're choosing, does it perpetuate stereotypical Black images? And if it does, why are we still doing that? We have enough of that canon already. What story have we not told that shows women in a different light? And then also just looking at how much we expect these women to take on with these heavier or larger than life characters. We need to be looking out for their psychological health within the rehearsal hall because it is not, we shouldn't ask them to do something that will harm them. Hmm. Especially if uh, the person who's asking is not gonna take that risk themselves. And I'm a huge advocate for intimacy directing because it, it starts the steps to saying, hey, this person has a boundary. Specifically, this Black woman has a boundary about this. And not shutting them down when they express that boundary because you want us all to be healthy, then give us a room to be healthy in. Yeah, and intimacy, um, intimacy directing is not just about, when I first heard about it a few years ago, uh, it was it introduced to me as something that had to do specifically with the physical mm -hmm. um, scenes and, and fight the scenes, what yeah. is safe. But you're bringing it, you're heightening it even to a place of being like an emotional. Yes, it is. It's an emotional state because 
whenever someone is coming together in an intimate act, whether it be a kiss or a hug, there is going to be this form of feeling coming up inside you. You can't shut that off. And if you have found a way, please, please email me. <laughs> you can't shut that off. So making sure that we're not rehashing a traumatic experience if we touch somebody or kiss somebody in a certain way. It's not just the physical, it's the mental that goes along with that physical connection. Now, I in no way am I saying intimacy directors are therapists. They're not. But it mm. is making sure we don't have to see those people in therapy. There's nothing. Okay. Wrong. We're getting a little close on time. Uh, I want to I want to piggyback off of what you just brought up, Amanda, and that is going into the rehearsal room or into the, the creativity space for you, Shaliqua, or Dr. Phillips and Dr. Abrams, how you, um, what, first of all, let's talk about the detrimental hierarchies we have seen in those spaces of creation um, uh, and how, how they have affected the process. Uh, to be more specific, what is the, what is the most glaring hierarchical uh, setup that you've seen, if that's not too large of a question? Does that make sense? Where do you feel like it's least safe for you to, to, to question, like authority or who's in charge? Just being a director, I'm very aware that actors are looking to me a lot to say, um, is this okay? Are you okay with this? But if we're really being collaborative, my opinion shouldn't always be the strongest one. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm very aware of that in the rehearsal hall or in any type of production sense. Yeah, and in the rehearsal space, whether you're dancing or, or acting um, or writing or doing something more private, you have a professor to answer to or someone who's the head of some sort of grant, a board of directors. Um, how do you navigate being in that space as a Black woman and when you get pushback or the microaggressions? Uh, that are told that we are visited, that are visited upon us on a regular basis, how do you deal with that? Or have you not had that experience at all? No, I've had it. <laughs> um, at some point, uh -huh. I, I personally, I, I, I have to realize that if I'm going to be okay after this and be able to look at myself in the mirror, then I have to advocate for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, have to, I have to stand up for what I think is going to keep me healthy and whoever is on my team healthy. Right. So I think that the, uh, the question that, I, that leads me to is how are there ways to enact some sort of equitable and open exchange for everyone? Um, I know with Shaniqua and Dr. Phillips and Dr. Abrams, there may be a little bit more autonomy in your work that you have a little bit more um, leeway in, in terms of uh, what you want to do and what you don't want to do in your work? Uh, have you not had the experience of having to uh, maybe push back when someone is saying that you don't know what you're talking about? I mean, in no uncertain terms in your work, you know, whether... Not so much um, the thought process that I don't know what I'm talking about. So um, similar to what um, maybe Dr. Phillips was mentioning, my experiences um, that I felt like were assault worthy <laughs> were in school mm -hmm. or under the, under the university throne, um, in which I felt like I had to pick and choose my battles. Mm -hmm. And we do that anyway, right? Um, but because I want my degree <laughs> and because I want to sleep at night. Yeah. I found myself picking and choosing what I was and was not going to speak to. Um, um, and, and with that, I found myself in some instances being silenced mm -hmm. right? and, and being very well aware of it. And that for me, because I come from a long line of loud mouth people who know what they're talking about, <laughs> it's difficult. Um, and in some ways feeling like something was being stolen from me because I chose to be silent. Um, and, you know, having autonomy now 
picking and choosing um, what I will and will not um, have myself a part of, um, that's freedom. Freedom to be able to move as I please. Um, I definitely felt stifled a lot under, um, under the university. Um, and, you know, I see where even now where professors that may have been in positions of power um, while I was in school, they have been removed. And, you know, I see where my, you know, former schools are now celebrating me. Hmm. That's powerful. Right. Because someone is no longer in position. Right. To stop that from happening. Um, and so there are a lot of ways I could speak to that. And I'm sure every, um, I'm not the only one. Yeah. I, I hate to, to um, move to the next question, but we have about five minutes coming up and I wanted to get to the question of social justice reform. Um, and I wanted each of you to take a little time to think about this and respond. We're in a time of social justice reform right now, and I want to know how much of it do you think should be designed specifically by Black women? Or do you think that's ridiculous? I'm sorry, all of it. All of it should be. <laughs> I think Black women should be at the head of every table, at every table, and have our own tables. Okay, okay. Really, really. Reform system that are, that are already broken, right? But creating whole new systems. I hear that. Building your own table, right? Right. I agree. I don't think I can add anything else to what my two colleagues said. Like, they said it great. Right. Yeah, uh, truth needs no decorum. Uh, black <laughs> women hold truth. We truth tellers. You won't know what's going on specifically as Black women. The women make it sweet, right? So when under places of conflict and difficulty, you seek the women because they make it sweet. And we're in a place where we need some sweetness, don't we? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Ladies, uh, I thank you for this time, personally. Um, and I want to wrap up by, uh, before we open up uh, to the Q&A, um, and I'll let everybody who's uh, joined us um, let it, let them know at the bottom of your screen, there is a button that says Q&A if you want to join um, after this panel is closed down. There's going to be a, a brief interlude. But before we move on, I'd like Dr. Phillips, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about what to expect from the Expressive Art Workshop that's immediately to follow this conversation. Absolutely. So all are welcome to an experience of the expressive arts. The expressive arts are different from art making that uh, may be presented in a space or a gallery or as a play or a film. And that the emphasis is, is totally on process. And so what one experiences creatively uh, is, is uh, often allows uh, one to reflect on something that's happening in their life or brings inspiration for considering a situation or a problem. So we don't make something that someone will critique, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And expressive arts are person-centered. So each person is always invited to participate in their own way. It's not about having to do things the way the teacher says or in a way that's uncomfortable. Someone may decide not to participate at all. Uh, so it's very open and I'll be leading uh, those who would like to, to explore in uh, some activities uh, using imagination and uh, writing uh, or reflecting without writing if you don't have writing materials with you. Uh, but just to have a little bit of a sense of what the expressive arts are like for healing and how that experience is different, perhaps, from other ways that you've thought about art. In a very safe space, a very safe space. Thank you so much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Phillips. Thank you all. It's been a great honor to spend time with you. And now um, uh, we're going to answer a few group, a few questions from the group. Um, uh, the wonderful people who have tuned in tonight. Um, and then the workshop is following that Q&A. So if you could join me over in at the bottom of your screen, 
you have um, a button that should have a button called that has Q and A on it, and you're going to type your questions in for the panelists in the chat box, and I am going to read them to them. I hope I get this right. So I've opened up my question and answer box. Now you open up yours. I'm ready. I think I did that right. I did do that right. Direct Alliance staff. Oh, yes, they said yes. Okay. So the first is more of a comment. Just wanted to say thank you, ladies, and sending much love and blessings and respect. And uh, the first question is, what words of encouragement or wisdom do you have for young Black women artists? And thank you. Who wants to take that one? I'll take it. I the world is ever changing while sometimes as of right now it may look a little grim with everything that is going on but your voice matters so much and find the way that you feel comfortable expressing it and using it and then stick with it i think that is something specifically for black women that to be told that your voice matters is something that I always need to hear. I still call my mom and ask her to say it to me just so I know that I matter. Your voice does mm -hmm. matter. Excellent. And Skylar would like to answer the question live. How are you going to do that? Oh, the mysteries of life and wonderful things we go through. Skylar? I think maybe okay. because Amanda answered it, Skylar was saying it was going to be answered live. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, what advice would, let me say, what advice would you, mm, all right, I'm getting, okay, here to come. Here to come, y'all. Pray with me. How was it breaking down barriers as a Black woman in your industry? I'm very inspired by other strong Black women's testimonies. Shaniqua, could you answer that one? Uh oh no! Or I mean, what? what, what, what I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, how is it breaking down? What was the question? Breaking down barriers as a black woman in your industry. Uh, they say they're very inspired by other strong black women's testimonies. Um, I, very hard question. I, I, I I love being, or have always been, for a very long time, like the only one in the room, right? Um, and so being content with that and I got that training in elementary school <laughs> um, right um, learning to be cool with being the only one in the room and sometimes being the only woman in the room um, and I love that because it gives me the opportunity the way that I've seen other black women to do is to make room for someone else right um, and always trying to um, as I'm breaking down barriers to um, operate uh, with a spirit of excellence right um, so that you see, um, and it, it doesn't take away humanity, and this is not the whole, um, you have to be twice as good notion, um, but that, right, um, speaking and thinking and creating with a spirit of excellence to say that I'm worthy uh, of my presence being here in this space, right? Um, and so it's been, it's been great. It's been difficult. Mm -hmm. And difficult, um, you know, sometimes being the one and only you are perceived to be a token. Um, and not just by um, people of none hue, but also by your own. Um, and uh, sometimes people have the notion that you speak for us. And I'm not always speaking for us. Mm. Uh, because uh, we are not all of the same cloth, right? All my skin folks and my kin folk. But I, I do, <laughs> I do uh, appreciate <laughs> the opportunity to be a lead um, uh, in my industry, in my field, and within uh, the spaces that I have created for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I had to, and I still do, um, 
not engage in my life's work passively, kind of understanding at a young age that it's not, it wasn't going to come to me, it wasn't going to be offered to me, um, particularly because I was in mostly white spaces um, from where I lived to where I was going to school um, to my field. Um, so I had to, to seek out who I needed, actively, actively seek out who I needed and not accept what was given to me because it wasn't enough. It wasn't me. It didn't reflect any of me. So I had to actively seek out mentors, <clears throat> actively seek out colleagues, kind of actively kind of expand my circle um, versus kind of waiting for some of that to come to me. And that was, that was a game changer for me that I, that I learned at an earlier age when I realized that I wasn't being fulfilled. I wasn't having the conversations that really kind of got to what I found to be important. So I stopped talking to those people. That wasn't, that was no longer worth it. I went towards places and spaces and people um, where my voice could boom and where my voice could reflect. Hmm. So finding places where you are, you are honored in your questioning as well as your answering and discovering of self. But actively seeking that. Actively seeking that out. <clears throat> There's a question here that you may uh, like to field first, Dr. Phillips. Uh, the question is, what term would you use to better express daily assaults on dignity, uh, such as microaggression? as opposed to microaggression that we experience as black women, what term would you use instead of that? Are you able to hear me? Yes, but your face yeah. is- Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Trauma, to, to recognize that for what it is, is trauma. As our ancestors experienced horrible trauma and slavery, there are euphemisms for work or punishment and slavery. To just to, to acknowledge something for what it is, and then we're less likely to feel somehow responsible for that or less likely to feel bad that we can't just get over it because of what it was. We can't just get over a door slammed on me as I'm trying to feel like a, a doctoral student starting out in psychology. It's a trauma and recognizing We have Dr. Phillips, you got you got quiet, but I don't think you hit mute. Can you say something else? And I, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. Well, did you hear what I, what was the last thing you heard that I said? I heard was recognizing as a doc, uh, doctoral student of psychology, making sure that um, that we acknowledge that it is what acknowledge it for what it is, which it's is the trauma. trauma. And this was a hostile environment. It wasn't a supportive environment. And so it wasn't about me not being able to fit in or become a professional in that set setting because that was an aspect of being in that setting and being aware of it mm -hmm. and not making it my fault or my responsibility uh, lets me, helps me be able to, to have the strength to continue on. And also to, to, to surround yourself with people who can reflect back a reality not something that's unhelpful. Okay. This next question um, is from a gentleman. As a black male, I'm hyper aware of my language when communicating with black women in my acting classes. I don't want to push my opinion on a character that may not be true about a black female character. What is some advice on how to successfully, collabor successfully collaborate with those students and also guide them? Did you ask them how they felt about the, about the piece? So that, you, that sounds a little flip, but like, did you really ask them what were their thoughts? How did they feel when they were taking on this role? And then what type of journey did it take them through? And then going back to the text and really focusing on what the text is saying and not necessarily your personal opinion. Because then if you have the piece it, that's backing it up, I don't think you're necessarily pushing your opinion, but what the playwright was saying mm. and, the ten, in, and the intention from the playwright. But probably the big question is, how do you get your actors to truthfully talk to you? A lot of dismantling power dynamics within the room so they feel free enough to open up. Mm -hmm. 
thank you for that. Um, this is going to be our last question, and I hope it includes everyone's experiences um, on the panel. The question is, do you feel there are positive changes taking place in academic settings to encourage Black women playwrights, actors, and writers? I would also say um, psychologists and thought leaders. Easy answer is yes. 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 There are things happening. There are things um, taking place. There are conversations happening. Um, has it been enough? No. But, but are, are things happening? Are, um, is there discomfort? Is there confrontation that is happening more and more? Yes. Yes. But it is a large kind of scope and kind of task to take on. So there, there, there will be time before we can actually see changes, mm -hmm. not only at an institutional level, but policy level that it has to kind of expand, you know, past that. But yes, we are. Yes. Brilliant. Anyone else? Do y'all? I can say I've had opportunities to be supervised by Black women. Uh, currently, um, uh, my supervisor in an academic setting is a Black woman, uh, the leader of our board uh, at our college, at Goddard College, is a Black woman. Uh, so, so yes, there are those opportunities, um, uh, and they're they're very helpful to mm. to because. Um, they have a sense of my lived experience in a different way that someone else may not, not that someone else could not. And also as an example, seeing every day, someone who's achieved a level, a level beyond the level in which I'm working personally is very helpful. Well, ladies, this brings us to the end of our time together in this space, but we are now moving into the workshop space with Dr. Phillips. Uh, this was wonderful, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. It was amazing. Mm -hmm.